We'll update board docs accordingly. Next item on our agenda is responses to citizen comments. Uh, Dr. Nichols. Good evening. This is a new feature uh, to work sessions. Uh, we receive or have been receiving comments at our regular board meetings. Uh, board policy states the superintendent will respond to those at the next regular meeting, by the next regular meeting. Um, the work session is a stop in between those two meetings, so we thought it'd be appropriate here to add it as an agenda item. Hopefully you've seen that we continue to be uh, flexible as we add microphones and second screens and uh, you know, continue to work through this piece. Um, so what I'll do is read the questions, provide the responses. Uh, we will also later link this to board docs. So when you look under responses to citizen comments, you will have an electronic copy of it, okay? All right, so um, the first questions are regarding the issue at New Kent Middle School on the book Poet X. Um, and it's two questions, who's reviewing and approving books that go into our middle school library? And B, who's responsible for giving the 11 year old book and what actions have been taking place to make sure it doesn't happen again? Um, so tonight, there'll be a presentation that addresses this question in more detail, uh, but for the purposes of, of this section of the agenda, the books that are added to the library are selected by media specialists for purchase and approved by building administrators. This book was part of a voluntary Hispanic Heritage Month activity and is rated 13 plus, which does fit for uh, some of the students at the middle school. This particular book has been moved from the middle school uh, the school media specialists are in coordination with the school board office, developing a process manual for how school media centers carry out the necessary procedures through the year. But you'll hear that in a lot more detail tonight, but wanted to uh, respond to that. The next series of questions, oh, I'm sorry, board members, if you have an additional follow-up, I can pause and after each or come back at the end. Uh, the next series is regarding CRT, which is critical race theory, DEI, diversity, um, equity, inclusion, and cultural competency training. And really these questions are centered around cultural competency training. Um, so the first question, has work been initiated on preparing instructional material for cultural competency training? And let me back a little bit and give context. So the uh, General Assembly passed a law, and I do have it, I believe, in the answers, the exact one it was, uh, that requires teachers to have cultural competency training as part of licensure, either initial licensure or renewal. So this is coming from General Assembly being interpreted by the Virginia Department of Education. So this is not a New Kent County Public Schools specific piece. This is for all schools in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Um, so has work been initiated on preparing instructional material um, so the answer to that is no, work has not been initiated locally for this requirement. This is coming from the state. Uh, B, how will a new teacher applying for a license to teach in New Kent get culturally, cultural competency training now required to get a teaching certificate? So, um, so New Kent County Public Schools, Superintendent Cluden has not seen the details behind this requirement. Uh, we do have various requirements that are through the Virginia Department of Education, dyslexia training, child protective services. There are a number of them. We do them through modules that are publicly facing on the Virginia Department of Education site. Um, so we expect those computer-based modules to be available once it has been developed by the Virginia Department of Education. That's our expectation. If that changes, uh, we'll certainly let everyone know. Uh, C, have New Kent Public School teachers been informed that they will have to take the cultural competency training before the 22-23 school year? Um, so just a nuance on that one, not all teachers will have to do it prior to 22-23. That's our read. Um, if you are initial licensure submittal um, or your initial license renewal or your license renewals in 22-23, you will need to do this requirement. For example, my license needs to be re renewed by the end of 2122. I will not have to, this requirement is not in place and my license is for 10 years. Actually, all of our licenses are not for 10 years. Um, we work with teachers closely during their licensure year uh, to make sure that they have all the necessary requirements. So whether it's coursework, whatever the points are that they need, we would do the same thing with this requirement as well. So just a clarification, yes. are all teachers licensed for 10 years too? Yes, the new licensure, if you're coming, like I'm finishing a five-year license, the initial license 
licenses have traditionally been five years. Teacher shortage, license renewals, those different pieces have been shifted to a 10 year license. So your next renewal will be for 10 years. So next year is the last year of five years. Okay. So everybody else will have been phased into 10 year license. So Dr. Nichols is saying that during that 10 year licensure, what are the current requirements for continuing education within those 10 years? And how does that continuing ed work in terms of their, um, is it elective coursework for their continuing education or are there are certain courses that are specified within their specialty that they have to take for continuing ed? Great question. And it, if the board would like, we can come back with a presentation that details licensure in more detail, but I'll, I'll answer your question uh, to the best of my ability now. And Ms. Anderson is here to back me up, although she moved from the table. Um, <laughs> so under your 10-year license, you're required to have 360 points. You can get those points in a lot of different ways. For example, we're working with teachers here right now who have shifted their instruction from in-person to virtual uh, in terms of a educational project. So you can get up to 90 points in an educational project. If you take a free credit course at a university, that's 90 points. So you can get those points in a lot of different ways. Uh, we have professional development day coming up on November 1st. Um, each hour of professional development or continuing, uh, what do they call it in the business world? Uh, continuing education. They, it's um, we have those as well. So every hour counts as one. So it's really sort of a mix and match. Um, related to those pieces. If you're taking coursework and you're a math teacher, it would be in that field okay. um, of study, but there's a, a whole menu of, of options that you can kind of work through. But. And I'll just add to that, um, as Dr. Nichols said, this is required by the state. Um, I have many colleagues in Virginia Department of Education is a, an executive branch agency. Um, I work for the state. I'm not an employee, I'm a contractor, but I have many colleagues in my state agency that are now undergoing the cultural competency training. So okay. just to add that. Um, I believe I'm on D. Will this school system develop the cultural competency training in-house or by contract? It's our expectation that's coming through the Virginia Department of Education. So um, it would not be, what we know right now, it will not be in-house because it needs to be consistent across 132 school divisions. Mm -hmm. So that's um, those pieces. Um, are teachers aware that they'll be evaluated on how they implement cultural competency training? Uh, that's E. Um, once again, once we understand the details of this potential requirement, we'll, we will share it with teachers. Um, make sure I'm lined up here. So I'll read it now is that it will be one of the standards. Uh, right now there are seven standards that you're evaluated on that I'm evaluated on as a superintendent. In this new model, there'll be eight, and cultural competency is one of those, but we have not seen under the hood to see what the details of, of that will be. Um, F, are you prepared to deal with the loss of teachers when they're confronted by what the state is gonna require? Um, so it's not a new Kent County Public Schools requirement. It's required for all Virginia teachers. Uh, we work extremely hard to recruit and retain, um, and we'll continue that mission. This one is, once again, legislated, and is now uh, pushed to school division. So we'll manage it and we'll work through it. Um, G, have you expressed your concerns to the Department of Education and or the state superintendent of schools? Um, yes, I express, express concern anytime I have an audience with state superintendents. One of my biggest concerns with this is there's a national shortage for teachers and we're gonna add an additional requirement for licensure. Um, so I think we need to be more innovative about about that process for teachers to make the pathways easier and not more difficult. I don't think this will be a strenuous process based on the other modules we have to do, but it's one more thing. Um, and I, I think we can, we can go at it in other avenues. So, yes. Okay, so that rounds out those, that was G. Um, the last question we had, how much, if any, New Kent County taxpayer funds are spent annually for membership in the National School Board Association and SBA. Um, New Kent County Public Schools is a member of the Virginia School Board Association, that's VSBA. Um, so we do not spend money annually on an additional membership for National School Board Association. Board members, if you remember, this is related to a um, article or a press release that the National School Board Association sent. Um, 
the Virginia School Board Association sent a counter thing to their members and also to the NSVA, uh, talking about the need for public participation, you know, civil engagement and, and, and so forth. So I also emailed that to the participant that shared that along with the VSVA piece. So that rounds out the citizen comments and the questions and the responses we will post. And then at our next, work, next regular meeting, uh, we receive additional questions. We'll continue that process or we'll edit it um, as we need to. And we'll continue to answer the questions at the work session. Yes, if you feel this format works, it does, it is two weeks faster than waiting until yeah. the regular meeting. I, and I think that's it certainly preferable. Can, yeah. can yeah. fit. I agree. Okay. I agree. I, I, think agree. I, I appreciate your effort in doing that. I think it's, um, it's really important that as we as these issues occur, as as you address them, as you did this evening, I think it's a very beneficial um, for for the board and for the for the citizens as well. And and I'll go back to your first comment about the uh, about the book. And I appreciate um, uh, Ross and his team of looking in that expeditiously. And as I explained to a couple of people and, and to the public in general, is that obviously every system is not perfect. And when we find uh, holes in the system that need to be plugged, that is our responsibility as board members to, to gather the necessary facts that are presented before us and do everything in our power to, as best we know how, is to plug those holes. And, and I think in this particular situation through, through Ross and his team and through having collaborative conversations is that I think that we did a pretty good job of of looking at the issue, addressing the issue, coming up with some resolutions. And I think that that is a, that is a positive thing for, for our community to see that, that we look at it, we address it, and then we come up with a resolution and that we don't leave those things hanging. And, I, and I'll go back to, even though this was not on your agenda, but I'll go back to the town hall meeting that happened yesterday with um, the, the mother who talked about even the bus stop. She was that concerned about it, which I think was a legitimate concern. And as a school board, it is a legitimate concern. And I think that this board and the community did a fabulous job of, of addressing that issue. As I told the board, I was so upset about that whole issue that two days later, I went personally to that church and, and figured out what was going on because I wanted to know. And but that's what it takes. If, if we hear a comment like that, in my opinion, all this stuff that we talk about daily is, is very, very important to the educational process. But when it comes to the safety of a child, my opinion, I'll drop everything that I'm doing and I'll aggressively go after it. And, and I think that we did a great job of doing that. And when it comes to the safety and welfare of a child, especially in that situation, we need to continue to be um, proactive as, and I appreciate Ms. McBeef and Mr. Lockwood of setting up that, that town hall to address that issue. Not that it's perfect, but at least, guess what? You know, we exist now, Absolutely. right? I mean, that, that's my whole point. And, and because I'm telling you what, I, I don't care if it's a church, I don't care if it's a business, we're not gonna let any business or church take advantage of any child because they have some hidden agenda. So, but, and I, so I appreciate um, Mr. B for being uh, proactive in making that happen. So and Mr. Mead, Mr. Mead, to your point um, on the initial piece about library book selection, we don't always get everything right. Um, and what you'll see, but we have a dedicated group of media specialists, Mr. Miller. I mean, we have some phenomenal people on this team and you'll see some upcoming steps for us to strengthen you know, anything that comes our way is an opportunity to strengthen a process Amen. or a policy or, you know, do that. And, and I think that's what you'll see uh, coming up here. Anyway. So thank you for that. Yeah, um, I'd like to make a couple of comments and thank you, Dr. Nichols, uh, for providing feedback to our parents and citizens um, through the comments from our regular meeting on October 11th. We are seeing greater interest than ever before in our schools across the country and we can't, it's no different. I had an opportunity to go back and look at some of the stats on the attendance and viewership from our meetings since May of this year. And from this period, interestingly enough, 154 parents, citizens attended in-person meetings here uh, in front of the board. 
33 citizens and parents have addressed the board during their regular meetings, during our regular meetings. And there have been over 1,500 YouTube views of both the regular and work sessions, with the regular meetings having higher viewership. I personally think that's incredible. Um, you know, in speaking with some of my colleagues in, you know, meetings before, you know, you didn't get a lot of folks here. And I think this truly demonstrates the tremendous and continued interest our parents and citizens have in issues affecting schools and education. And on another note, yesterday, uh, District 5 held a town hall meeting focusing on the specific specific needs of our neighbors in the Plum Point community. The meeting was open to all and the following uh, folks attended. Uh, John Lockwood, who is my District 5 um, Board of Supervisor counterpart, uh, Sheriff Joe McLaughlin, Rodney Hathaway, and from the district, Dr. Nichols and um, Mr. Hentz, uh, who's Director of Transportation. And I would like to thank uh, Dr. Nichols and Mr. Hentz for being on hand to hear um, the feedback and questions that are most that mostly focused on roads and the, and the bus stop issue. And again, I appreciate uh, Mr. Mead going down to uh, one point and, and knocking on the door. The meeting was very well attended with an estimated 30 citizens in attendance. And I think it's a great opportunity to engage with parents and constituents outside of the traditional meeting venues. I know Ms. Swinford has also held town halls in her district with key county leaderships. And I just learned that Ms. Barber will be teaming up with her board of supervisor counterpart uh, in early November. And if I just throw this out there, might I suggest the board um, consider this information and determine if there are any additional opportunities to seek public input input in these forums. Thank you. So it's been a while, but we used to do uh, town halls as a group. We would have, you know, especially for things that affect the entire community. So any of these types of issues that we're talking about tonight um, would be something that we would have you know, done in the past. Is that something that we would like to try to do is put one on here so that all the members of the community could come to that school or wherever would be the best place for to do that. Uh, Ms. Tasco, I'm happy to do some of that coordination and, and logistics work uh, because it would involve more than two members of the board. It would be an announced public meeting, technically. Mm -hmm. uh, we could structure it in a way I would propose the high school auditorium. Um, just a bigger venue, football stadium if we needed it. Um, <laughs> but just we have actually we actually have better video capability in the gym. But we could we could do something and and structure it around some pretty big topics mm -hmm. that we have going on um, in the school division, from a reminder of elementary redistricting to uh, updated quarantines and you know all we could we could certainly if the board want yeah. to we can do something i mean to me it makes sense to have the individual district meetings when it's something pertaining to that district like the, the school bus stop or whatever the case may be but if it's issues that affect the entire county it seems to me that the entire community would benefit from having that town hall. so more to, more to come on that i don't know whether or not we would ask people to submit their questions in advance it seems like it would be more productive that way but maybe yeah. we'll, we'll circle back to that. I later. think we could probably do both because, you know, other questions will arise during the discussion, but I think mm -hmm. that it's helpful because we can provide a little more detailed uh, response mm -hmm. given a little bit of time. Okay. Board members, I'd be happy to bring an update to you at November 8th okay. public meeting and, and share possibilities and dates and okay. uh, if, if it's a pleasure to the board. Please. That was sounds good. I say November 8th, I believe that's our next meeting. You know, I do throw dates out sometimes when I'm day off, but never, okay. Can do. So next item on our agenda is the overview of the library book selections. Uh, Mr. Miller. Okay. 
Madam Chair, members of the board, um, Dr. Nichols, uh, thank you for the opportunity to share about our library program uh, this evening. Um, as Dr. Nichols mentioned, we have a very, uh, very dedicated, passionate media specialist staff. They do an amazing job. And so anytime we get a chance to talk about all the work they do, um, in any light, is, um, is a pleasure. So um, tonight, I have a set of slides to go over with you and some information just regarding the way in which we go about um, the selection of books that go into our library. And most of what you're going to see is straight out of our policy manual. Um, and so, So this is um, our policy that lays out our library media centers and what is their purpose. Um, they have a very vital role within the school. They are, they, they are the hub of literacy for a school. They provide um, all sorts of research materials as well as um, just uh, uh, basically things for students to be able to explore the love of reading and to promote uh, the love of reading as well. They work with teachers directly on how to incorporate research into their lessons, and um, they work with students on how to conduct that research and teach research skills. And then, as I said, they also work closely with the students from K all the way to 12 on how do you develop a love of reading and how do you select books that you're going to enjoy. They also, um, that's just the literacy part. You'll see on here, they do a lot with media equipment and the idea of a library versus a media, the library of old and the media center of today is pretty different. Now, directly um, in regards to the selection of materials, uh, this is Strata Policy IIA. Uh, the library media specialists, they are, they select the material that will go into the, into their space and they work with the principal on purchasing those materials. So they pick it out and then they make recommendations to the principal who purchases it. The, um, our media specialists, they're trained in this process um, through their coursework. They all have master's degrees in library sciences and they um, take this very seriously as far as them selecting what goes into these spaces for our kids. So some of the things that they consider um, when they're picking out what should and should not come into the library, um, A, if possible, they, um, they'll read what comes into the library. Uh, when they're picking um, a lot of books for a year, that's not always, uh, always possible. So they do rely then on national lists and national programs to make suggestions, such as the American Library Association, the American um, Association of School Librarians as well. Uh, along with some others that I'll go over um, in a little bit. Some of the things that they consider though are um, basic the needs of the school. And so they look at the population of the school, what's the curriculum in the school, and how can they come alongside the teachers with um, more fiction or nonfiction or nonfiction or fictional material that will support what they're teaching. As well as they look a lot at what are the students into, what do the students want to read because they are trying to develop that love of reading. And so they, they talk a lot with our students on what are you interested in? What are some different things that you would like to, you would like to see books on? Um, and so that gets into that request from users of the collection. They talk to the administration faculty. They do take suggestions from parents as well as from students. Um, and they do look at a wide range of ability level um, interest. At all levels, that is very wide when we look at like kindergarten through fifth grade, you're talking about five-year-olds all the way to 10-year-olds going to the same library. At the middle school, you're talking about 10-year-olds to 14-year-olds. There's a drastic difference between a 10-year-old and a 14-year-old and what they are ready for. Um, and then at the high school, 14 all the way to 18. So um, they do try and hit a wide uh, range, both appeal as well as appropriateness. So they look at purpose, they look at the timeliness of the books that they're reading. So making sure that we don't have a collection that's based out of the 1970s and making sure that it's up to date with current um, literature. The, um, they look at the subject matter as well as how, what's the quality of the writing, making sure it's readable by their, um, by their students and that it's going to be popular. Um, so it's going to move off the shelf and be desirable for the students to read. We do also look at how does it support the educational program and age and developmental appropriateness. So one of the, some of the ways that um, on a practical level, this is not out of policy, this is just out of, we sat down last week and had a big discussion on how they do this and 
So they review the collection each year to determine sort of what genres or categories need additional development. They also do a, a, an inventory each year and look at the books and see which books are, are damaged too much that they need to go ahead and move those off the shelves and get either the replacements for or transition out of the collection. So some of the things that they review when they're trying to determine um, what, what to purchase, big piece of that is on student interest and what are the students going to want to read. But they also rely on some national book lists by like the American Library Association, AASL, uh, Follett, which is the company that produces our um, card catalog system, our digital card catalog system. They have a whole, um, they have a system called Tidal Wave in which they uh, recommend books as well as give you reviews of books and um, both for content as well as age appropriateness. That's why I have them down below as well. Uh, and then they also look at what genres categories are not adequately represented in their current collection. So they do take a look at, you know, what are, what are students reading? What are those areas that they need to beef up? Or what are some different um, types of authors that they need to um, include? Uh, books are approved for age appropriateness, again, by looking at Follett Title Wealth at Title Wave. They do also look at Common Sense Media, um, American Library Journal, and, um, and then uh, also Goodreads if they need to. Um, but they look at these to look at how appropriate it is for the students that are in their building. So this is how, when we get, come across a learning material that someone is concerned about, there is a process. And we're, um, so this is straight out of the policy manual as far as uh, policy KLB. And how we look at that is it starts at the building level. And we do have a form in there for families or anyone to fill out and submit to our schools if they're concerned about something. And uh, it takes a parent through the process of identifying sort of why is it being used and to see what's the educational value. And um, so then once they submit to that to the building, the building reviews it. And then if the parent or whoever is not still not satisfied, it would come to the school board office, the superintendent or designee to review. And then lastly, if they're still not satisfied, then it would come to the school board to make a final decision. Um, and when you we're going to get to a point where you get to upcoming steps and I'll outline some of the things we're doing with this process coming forward. So this is that process more bulleted just to make it a little bit easier to, to go through. So form is requested from the principal, submitted to the principal, they make a determination, then the school board or then the school board office, then the school, a school board if necessary. I don't want to cut. Well, and I think to both of you is, and I think that's a great point because I think one of the, the things in moving forward as we tweak the process a little bit is when we're talking about this, we need to make it really easy for the parents to be able to access that information. Because I guarantee you that probably 98% of the parents didn't even know that a form existed mm -hmm. to be able to do that and then who do I call? So that may be one of those forms that the first memo that goes home with the kindergarten class, the first week of school that says, this is the form. Mm -hmm. yeah, this form is accessible online under the elementary school website. If you have mm -hmm. issues or concerns to try to make it easily accessible to all, uh, all parents and students so that they kind of get the big picture that they don't have to hunt for it mm -hmm. somewhere. Yeah. Thank you. So some upcoming steps, uh, it was great meeting with sitting down with the media specialists and talking through this with them. I mean, they take this responsibility very, very seriously. And so they, uh, when we talked through the, the process for reconsideration, um, we are gonna be working with media specialists and principals to clearly define that process um, and ensure you know, we have a variety of viewpoints. One of the suggestions that's come up is like having a sort of a, a, a panel um, that looks at it that is it that incorporates parents, administrative teachers that review the piece and make a decision. And then at the, at the school board office level, a very similar process of a panel that looks at the piece so that we get a very um, 
all stakeholders get a say in, in whether or not that piece should be included. And we do have some some parents and volunteers that are uh, have come forward already and said that they would help with that cool. initiative, right? Yeah, yes, we have. So, um, so we're sort of fleshing out what that's going to look like and uh, and who would be on such a panel and um, and to make sure that all viewpoints are are represented on that. Um, also, one of the things that um, that we noted that we talked about in that meeting was a lack of there's not a media center program guide basically for the division that in New Kent, this is what we believe about media centers and this is how we run the media center. And, um, and so we wanted to develop that. So we're going to be working on that throughout this year, uh, development of a guide. To, this is what how we how the media center runs. And I mean, one of the things that came up with the middle school and talk about the high school, the young adult category is a very difficult category to categorize where does it go uh, a very difficult genre it, it does similar it does sit at sort of an edgy point and so um one of the things that like the middle school media specialist brought up she's like she she would like um I advocate for an, basically an opt-in process for parents to be able to, if a child because the young adult how it's rated is that's a 13 year old to an 18 year old and so they would advocate for basically having an opt-in uh, parent review for young adult titles that if your child would like to would like to um, check one of those out, that the parent would be notified first and given the opportunity to review the book before the child checks that out. Um, is, and, just a quick question. Is, yeah. is this PG-13 kind of comparable to what a movie PG-13 would be? Yes. Okay. This is the closest thing that we have to, to like a, the PG, PG-13 type rating. Mm -hmm. um, so young adult would be a, a PG-13-ish book, whereas um, like adult fiction would be the 18 and older uh, type book. Um, and so that's one of the processes that we discussed in that meeting um, that the, um, the parent could request to be contacted at any time a book that is above that 13 level because at the middle middle school level especially we've got 10 year olds and all the way to 14 year olds and it, it's hard to to find books that both groups are going to really enjoy um so and really develop that um that reading so that is everything i had i'm happy to entertain any questions that you may have and answer those i think the sticker process is is, is, is an awesome process if, if we could somehow institute that then even if that book went home by accident however it happened and <clears throat> then it, it would alert every parent that okay well you know with that sticker process yeah and i think part of this too which is a great observation for us even in this situation is i hope one of the things that comes out of this as we tweak this <clears throat> And we're all guilty of it, even as parents, when, even when my girls are in school. It's a matter of, and I, I don't know about you guys, but the majority of parents, they don't know what their kids are reading. They never look at their books when they bring them home from the library, and they check their books out from the library. And so I'm hoping that this, through this process, will get them more engaged to let them know, look at the books that your kids are bringing home. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and for whatever, because it could have been a referral from one of their friends. Mm -hmm. And just because it's appropriate for Ross doesn't mean that it's appropriate for, uh, for Mr. Hockman. You know, and, and I mean, and I think those, that's a good way for parents to be engaged. Another way for their parents to be engaged in, in their everyday lives of what's going on. Another question. Did for the books that are young adult, would we have them in their own specific section? Yes. So that way we would be able to tell if the 10 year old was not in the correct section. Correct. Okay. Yes. Yeah, we can we can have specific genres in certain areas of the library so that we can make sure of that. But to your point, Mr. Miller, it is a very difficult age group. Um, young adult fiction is very challenging as the parent of a 14 year old daughter. I can attest to that. So <laughs> we do encourage parents to to be involved, be proactive and um, and understand what your children are reading because as they transition out of chapter books, it can be very challenging. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Thank you for this presentation. Mm -hmm. Okay, next item on our agenda is recommended fiscal year CIP review. Ms. Morgan. Uh, 
that's okay. That's all right. We'll make sure everybody can hear. Uh, so it is that time of year where we begin the capital improvement process. Uh, Mr. Pollock is joining us for his technical expertise uh, and everything else, Mr. Pollock. Um, but Ms. Borgheim, we're going to talk to you about our capital improvement planning process. This is your first look at what we're thinking, so we definitely want your input on it. We're also going to show you where there's some unique intersections because of some things that are going on federally um, and some work that we our finance team has done a great job on here as well. So um, we'll, we'll show you what CIP looks like, what we're thinking. Um, it is complicated a bit. We do not have a number from the county yet. Um, so we're working through under needs, but we also have a slide of hopes and dreams. So beyond this year and some big things we wanna do. So Ms. Morheim, that was my intro. Thank you, Dr. Nichols. Madam Chair, board members, this is really our CIP plan for FY23. And actually the county requests these to be submitted actually about a week ago, but we always like to come to you first to just talk through what our request will look like and kind of um, what requests we'll bring forward to them. So we will bring this back to you at a later date for approval of our recommended CIP plan. We just like to give you kind of an overview of where we're headed and make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, some of these you've seen. Some of these you have seen in the past, and one is a digital conversion. Um, there's some history to that. It's a it's a CIP transfer into support our one to one initiative. It's two hundred thousand dollars in the current year, and our hope would be to reduce that and eventually just kind of have that to fade out of our CIP process. School buses obviously is something that we need every year. Um, this is actually for five buses, and we will most likely be looking to purchase additional buses through additional reserves or even ESSER funding. So these are five buses. They have air, GPS. That's sort of become the standard in the, in the buses that we purchase. So We have a paving line. Uh, Mr. Pollock has been working through paving throughout the district, and this specifically would be for the... Um, transportation area, basically around the entire fence, not within the fence-in property, but around the entire outside of the transportation department. You may have noticed that we did the high school bus loop, which was last year's CIP, uh, well, for this year, uh, but just makes a huge difference. And we own a lot of pavement. There's a line item for middle school mechanical design. And this is really just to, and Mr. Pollock may talk about this a little bit more, but to um, basically look at a redesign of the middle school mechanical room and the fire pumps and hot water heater and things of that nature. We still have an old building over there. And this is just strictly for design and then we go back to some kind of food and plumbing and for some, some help with this. I eat on the other stuff I don't mind doing some design. Which, uh, what do we fuel those boilers with? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, we so one of the goals in the CIP is just the modernization of existing mm -hmm. equipment. Mm -hmm. So I mean, you'll see that as a big theme um, as our schools age. Um, and then you'll see some other projects as we go through. Another item we have on here, um, which may seem a little strange, but it's not actually when you really look into it, it's a high school roof replacement. And um, this is similar to a project that we did at Newton Elementary School. Um, and something that Mr. Pollock, we, we may not need to do right away, but it's certainly something that will assist us moving forward with not having as much repairs as we currently have. So what, we're in, so what I wanted to bring this forward is that the, the roof is deteriorating for our age. And it makes, what you don't want to do is let it become where the insulation is saturated below because then that's a poor mm -hmm. uh, What we did like over at the elementary school, we were mm -hmm. able to coat that or to coat the existing roof of it for about what I was looking at the sections that are already starting to deteriorate is sitting over a plane saying, hey, this year we'll do good 
this section, this year we'll do that section over here. Or we can do the whole thing depending on how you want to fund it. What's the warranty on the roof? Is it a it, it, this is a 20 year Okay. So it's, it's 20 year roof. 20, uh, uh, 27 was the 20 year When was it built? When was the high school? Oh, wait. Yeah. And no, oh, wait. Would be 20 years would be 20 years. So we're still within our warranty. We are still within the warranty. What the warranty requires, what they require by warranty is just that they come in anytime it leaks and put a patch on the top of it. So you understand when you do roof warranties like that, that's what you're getting. So that's why I was saying that, like, when you come here, 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 you roof, you've got a metal decking, and it gets saturated and pulls water in, so deteriorating the metal decking. So then when it's time to tear it off, you have to tear the roof off, the insulation out, and repair all your metal decking so you can go back. But doesn't the war warranty come into play when it when it starts to see through it all? That, that they will come and fix that leak. That they will part, not take and repair the insulation or the damage that's below. They will just come in and put a patch over that leak. It's a really tight one. Okay. Hmm. Spot patch. That's what it's called. And, and Basically, have... your drain will go from this leak right here, like if you would have your house drain up right there, mm -hmm. uh, you're down to a very little drain. In certain areas. So we have problem areas. Yeah, we're already doing a lot of maintenance up there. Mm -hmm. the, the, uh, the manufacturer says this is outside the contract, and we've just been doing it to push these so it's probably for the outside agents. So the board members, you may remember that we took on the GW roof and we did it in phases. This mm -hmm. would be a similar approach here. You would actually mm -hmm. see this coming. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's that? We also did New Kelly. New, New Kelly. So you would see this coming through as a capital project, mm -hmm. similar to buses, mm -hmm. until we're able to get the whole project. We'd start with the areas that are most neat, and then we work our way through, and then in three years have the whole roof back under a twenty-year warranty. Okay. Okay. If the idea of doing it coating, one of the coatings that doing the coating, you can come reapply the coating. You don't never have to do the tear off again and all the stuff you do. Unless you let it completely go again, like I'm saying now, you have to recoat it. Mm -hmm. But coating the roof is a lot different than mm -hmm. it tearing and replacing, especially when it fills up trees and that's what you want. Okay, we'll move forward and the, I'll take the next two kind of sorted together. So we actually just recently received a grant, it's kind of detailed below the coronavirus state and local fiscal recovery fund, specifically for HVAC replacement and improvement projects. And the grant is for 617,797, but there's a 100% local match requirement. And you'll see that the projects that we are going to be submitting for in our application are our middle school HVAC replacement project, which if you remember over the over many years, we've been slowly replacing the units at the middle school. Um, so basically we're looking at, let's take care of that entire project with this grant. Yeah. Um, middle school is definitely the place most need. We put the most money there in the past three years. This would allow us over the next couple of years to have a dedicated funding source to get that exactly where we need to be. Some other items that we would um, do with that grant are the controls and install at GW and New Kent High School, and then also one New Kent High School rooftop makeup air unit. Uh, with the $50,000 request just above that, that's really to just maintain the three unit replacements that we've been doing up until the point where we can get to where we do that project. There will likely be a supply chain stressor with this. We're not the only one that received this grant. Um, so we're looking at phasing it across a few years in order for the supply chain um, factors within it. So that's why we have multiple things that we're working on depending on what we can get in the quickest and then work through that. Uh, a lot of this work has to happen in the summer. We can't take a school offline um, to do that. We simply don't have the room. So we'll be doing it across the last couple, the next couple summers, just like we have been just in larger scale. Does the grant have an expiration date? It does. The grant has an expiration date of 20... 2024 it is the um, last time that you have really to encumber the funds and then you can reimburse for it up through 2026. So right now we're looking at a three-year process. 
potentially not even starting this summer, but the summer after. And we're still just kind of fleshing out those details just based on the uh, workload for Mr. Pollock and his group and all of the other projects being requested. Will we be able to maximize that grant money? Absolutely. That's our intent. Yeah, so, our intent is the one to one. And we have a couple of different ways we can do that. One is through CIP, which you see 205932. That's a third. So we can attack it through every, every those year. means. Mm -hmm. right. When we do our CIP request, we basically request five years out. So we would have that as a request for the next three years. So if that doesn't work for some reason, we have a year end tra transfer process and we can we can attack it that way as well. So we have a couple of different avenues to make sure we maximize that. Mm -hmm. to, to move forward 1.2 million HVAC in New Kent is huge. We want to make sure we maximize that. So we're uh, committed to that. And the, the award is only about four or five weeks old. We're still getting the details uh, behind it. So as we continue with HVAC, we're looking at GW having a replacement of the units on the annex building. That's four units, um, $68,000. And then just general roof maintenance like we've had in the past and also painting of our facilities. So those are all of our current um, things that we're at least you know, considering as we kind of wait and work through with the county on what these funds might look like. And we may need to make um, some adjustments, but we feel really good about those particular items. And also um, one thing, just want to note with, with folks that are new to the CIP process, you basically get a line item for these. They're funded and then you basically can carry them forward. So for instance, in the current year, if there are projects that we weren't able to complete because of shipping delays or things like that, those funds do get reappropriated in the year after. And we do have that typically year over year. With that being said, um, we also have other considerations for CIP projects. And most of you are aware that we do have uh, year end carryover funds go into a CIP reserve, um, which has been really great for schools to be able to uh, tackle some pretty big projects. So we like to always have a list of things that we're looking into and costing out. So the, the, better we save during the school year, either through attrition or savings, almost every job, and I'll jinx it right now that Tim does, we have savings on. So we're able to have substantial year-end savings at the end of the year. Last year was an incredibly different year, so we didn't staff the way that um, we would typically staff. So you know we could have additional year-end savings. Uh, it allows us to, to move forward on some additional projects too. So it's a nice reward for us to, to be fiscally responsible, which we would be anyway, but to utilize those savings to go forward with more capital projects. You guys have done it uh, with the stadium lights, which homecoming happened under the stadium lights on Saturday, or the homecoming dance. The basin pond, which we've been able to do recently, that was a huge item that we were able to pull, um, and a lot of other projects like that. We've done the high school vestibule, we've done library renovations, you know, multiple projects. So this additional considerations for CIP projects. So if we've talked about a project and you didn't see it on that last list, you may see it on this one, um, but there are other pieces. Um, so the high school now has the secure vestibule when you walk in you know, with the window. We'd like to figure out a way to do that at the middle school, which is difficult because it's a split level school when you walk in. Conceptually, like on a piece of my paper, we have like an idea that we would like to go forward with that could provide additional um, office space, but we need architecture and engineering to kind of look at some of that stuff. That's another either through year end set capital set aside or through future projects, we could do something like that. Um, athletics, we have some big hopes and dreams for athletic facilities. Um, and we'd like to tackle some of that through capital set aside year end um, or uh, through the capital project uh, when it comes to storage, when it comes to facilities, when it comes to you know, grass versus turf, lots of different um, places. For most folks coming to New Kent, you're coming into this stadium. We wanted to make that feel that this high school does. Um, so lots of different considerations under athletics, and I'm sure you guys may have some as well. Um, we're looking at space at New Kent Middle School. You know, that's a big priority. We have a couple opportunities to add some additional space within by reconfiguring some of the spaces. There's a locker room that has some additional space. Um, Mr. Pollock and I've talked about a way to potentially add more common area space, specifically the cafeteria. While we have more classroom space, that cafeteria is still relatively small. 
Um, so we are looking at engaging in some of those arenas as well. Um, we have some non-bus needs in terms of vans, trucks, potentially. Um, and then uh, this last one is really kind of Haney's branded it. So I'll let her talk about <laughs> the imagining. Well, we just, obviously we've talked about renovating the Ken Elementary School for a while. And I think it's just important that we look at the issues that we're having, parking, um, traffic flow, things like that. Um, you know, we've, we've brought to the table before relocating Tim's shop and things of that nature. Um, we have tennis courts there that are very old and um, not being used currently. So really, I guess, um, you know, what I feel like we need to do is really look at it, reimagining that entire space and what that could be for the county, not just for New Penn Elementary School, and really just be smart about the redesign of what that could be. Um, so that's something that I think we're pretty passionate about looking into and really um, trying to get the most bang for our buck. And in conversation, previous conversations with, with, with county officials, there's the historic school sits there as well that's currently not being utilized. We're actually utilizing it for storage. There is a possibility RCC is looking at putting a welding space over at bridging. So there is a real possibility to reimagine that whole corridor as we're calling it, uh, bookended with uh, bridging and then New Kent Elementary. Uh, so it's a huge project, but could be a joint effort. I would say, uh, your is that one of the things that we're going to run into in the next two to three years is that, you know, with the expansion of the Oaks and Diastens Reservoir, uh, the subdivisions down the road here, is and on top of probably another 30 to 40 townhomes that they're going to be building here too. I mean, the afternoon and morning traffic is, is only going to get that much more challenging. And getting in here in the mornings, I mean, Talk about reimagining something. Holy yeah. cow. I mean, well, and that's kind of what we'd like to do on the New Kent Elementary is pull some of that traffic mm -hmm. away. But yeah. even saying that, yeah. uh, you know, another outlet out of here. Yeah, we've got we've to figure out another way to get them out on the other side of almost like where the new post office is, you know, like a big loop behind everything to get them out. And Tim's maintenance tent staff does a great oh, job. Just, I mean, it's Charlie's here too. Guys have to do that. I mean, they look at, I mean, it looks like. I think they would all agree. Every day trying to get back in. Yeah. I think they would all agree as far as directed yeah, traffic. Just like, wow. Yeah, absolutely. They should get crossings already. So um, other year end con considerations. So as we work through with the year end process from last year, um, Ms. Morheim mentioned uh, possibly adding an additional school bus to get ahead of that schedule. Um, we have some one-time expenses. Uh, you know, we've done a significant amount of work on our grounds this year. Um, you know, that's money we spent that was not budgeted that we can carry over and, and uh, pay for that. Uh, school set aside, you know, future school construction projects. As we save in the current year, we'd like to put aside for future big school projects, whether it's New Kent Elementary School or New Middle School, but to really, um, you know, put money in, in that pot of money. Are that's we, how we are, got to the school we have now. Are we projecting timelines for that for something like the elementary school? That's gonna be a major capital project. Yes. We, we, so We need to have a target for that. Uh, we have, Andy, do we actually have a target for that? That's, a, that's as a, soon as possible. Yes. <laughs> so what we're looking at, just to, this is just a rough timeline, Ms. Ms. Barber. Um, and we definitely need to hash this out with more people, but we're looking at New Kent Elementary. Quentin will be done um, next year. Looking at five years on New Kent Elementary and then potentially mm -hmm. another five for New Kent Middle School. If we're able to do some of the expansions and open up some space, we may be able to buy more time. Uh, we do know the high school comes off the debt uh, in, I think, 27. That's a huge borrowing piece there. So we're really kind of timing all of those aspects um, out. So we're looking at a rough estimate five on New Kent Elementary and then 10, but a lot of factors play into that. Um, Reimagining two, the 249 corridor is definitely a, a long overdue. Yeah. Um, It can just really open up that space and make it, you know, quite beautiful and functional. Right. 
maybe this is another question I forgot to look at as well. Are, are we still going to be able to get that um, now that Rosie slash Colonial Downs is up in functioning 100% now, are we still going to potentially have set aside money that the county is going to help us with when we walk, look at some of these things as well? The county is still currently setting aside the money piece. Okay. What we've talked about is, is can we once again develop a, a school specific set aside like we had before. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, so right now it's right. going into a bigger bucket, my understanding, a bigger bucket for capital projects. Um, what Haney and I are talking about and what we'll continue to um, you know, look at is, is a school specific one. That's right. And we were just talking to Mr. Hathaway about the possibility of setting up a school specific set aside that we could continue, you know, because we were trying to put funds into that set aside. Um, on our end, and so appreciative of the work the Board of Supervisors did in raising that money as well. So just to have that extra place where we can kind of set aside things that we know for these projects that we want to do down the road so we can help to contribute to that. I mean, it really came in handy with Quentin as far as the borrowing and the and that project, Tim and Kyle will talk to you about it a little more, but really um, coming along well and we're determined to make that a very positive experience for everyone involved to be able to do all that and not raise taxes in the mean it's a huge testament to saving and we'd like to repeat that process um and then uh one-time salary needs or and custodial modifications so as um and you want to speak to that one? Yeah, really just a continuation of some of the work we are, we're doing with COVID and maintaining different things with that we are being as creative as possible with all of the grant funds that we have. And like I said before, we are always trying to make sure that we're trying to move New Kent forward, not just purchase something necessarily because it helps in the moment with COVID, but really trying to also reimagine, you know, what, what those federal funds can do for New Kent, not just now, but down the road. So anytime we have an opportunity to fund something through one of those grants, that's a one-time type payment, we would definitely do that. Um, but it may be that there's a better opportunity to use those federal funds for. And then this is like, for example, having additional support with SSC right now, that might be something that we just ask for a year and transfer to cover that. Part of our year-end savings was really just being very good about our utilizing our grants for expenses that we continue to receive. And as we receive and continue to do that work, we gave you a lot as far as you know maintenance and, and upgrades and then some big projects. Anything that's on your list that you don't see kind of represented and you don't have to, this comes back before you again, before we approve. And so it doesn't have to end now, but just for the purposes of my team and continuing to work on that, uh, any thoughts or anything? So, uh, a little more understanding of the custodial modifications. What's the plan? For SSC, is this a one? This is a one-time. Yeah, basically, what I asked for there was an additional fund for the floor tax and a day order to okay. keep up the buildings to the standard we're asking for. Okay. And that would be for this year, as of right now. Okay. Because ultimately, that's sort of the maintenance thing, and we're typically a continuing. Right. And we decided cost. that that would be a level that we would need for next year. That would come to you in the budget request. Okay. So right. Yes. Next item on our agenda is sale of SNS surplus item. Ms. Moore. Yes, Madam Chair, board members, Dr. Nichols. Um, Ms. Smith would like to sell one of her large sand mixers. She did originally have a long list of large equipment that she wanted to sell, basically, honestly, to make room in the kitchen for storage for items that she's able to get. Um, but she actually ended up holding on to a lot of those mixers in case she had to make large batches of rolls or something of the sort. So she is actually just um, asking for the sale of one of these mixers. Which school is this coming out of? It's coming out of the high school. Okay. So it's a relatively new. So 
switching to old business. We have Ms. Deska, we've got to add the calendar discussion we added oh, to date. Yes. Sorry. That's for, yes, please. If um, you can. Absolutely. So, um, board members, we've had a lot of conversation uh, working with staff groups on calendar. Um, this has been. Um, I'm incredibly proud of our staff for what they've been able to put together to keep us in session five days a week um, with our quarantines, uh, with the lack of substitutes. It has been all hands on deck. Um, so in covering classes, uh, covering lunches, you name it, doing those pieces. So we're looking at some opportunities in the calendar to provide additional time for staff. Um, so we're looking at the first semester, and then this continues to be a fluid situation. We added some additional professional development days in the previous calendar process. And now looking at it again, I'd like to recommend um, that the 22nd and 23rd of November um, be uh, days that the schools are closed for 10 and 11 month employees. That provides uh, a week Thanksgiving break. Um, it'll benefit us from a cleaning protocol standpoint it'll benefit us from a quarantine standpoint um, and it'll provide a, a little bit of a break for our employees um, who um, are burning the candle at both ends to keep us up and and moving and uh, i'm incredibly proud of them i'd also uh, like to recommend that i continue to work with my staff principals and teachers so i had teacher advisory last week and that's where this really came from um, i would like to continue working with that group to look at the second semester and see if there are a couple opportunities there. Um, the two days that we are typically in in November are uh, some of our most poorly attended days uh, with families. Um, and for a instructional standpoint, they're not the most significant hard hitting uh, days as well. So that would be the recommendation that we do alter the calendar, which do, does require board approval to make, um, to have schools closed on the 22nd and 23rd of November. And if approved, we would make the modification to the calendar. We would send a message to families and we would update staff as well. So that be happy to answer any questions you have on that, but that's a, a quick summary of, of where we are. And just to clarify that, um, Dr. Nichols, is that closing school for those two days does not, does not affect our instructional calendar it does not mean that we have to add any days to the end of the school year. It doesn't take away from anything that we are currently doing because we have additional days slash hours built in our current schedule that will compensate for these two days. Absolutely, thank you, Mr. Mead. That was a great question. So by state code, we're required to do 180 school days or 990 hours. The current schedule that we have has us above the 990 hours, uh, which we really always are. Um, by doing this now, we're still well above that mark. Uh, I am hoping for a glorious warm win winter with no weather delays or anything like that, but it also reserves time there for me to make those beloved snow calls um, and look at the second semester. So from a uh, time standpoint, Mr. Mead, we're in great shape in regards to time. Uh, we always go above the minimum. And it, it still provides that buffer there for any weather calls or, or weather delays uh, that are in place. Next item on our agenda is Clinton Elementary School. Mr. Pollock. And Ms. At each work session board members and for the public, if you're tuning in for the first time, we always do an update on Quinton Elementary School, just to keep the public and the board informed of where we are in the process. Uh, this is one of the most exciting projects that we have. And uh, I tell you what, every time you drive by, you see something new and exciting. So that was my delay to give you guys. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll be, I'll be my <laughs> 
Well, we can talk about to start with. We are, as of right now, we're 24 days behind the schedule to get on the schedule. And budget is still where we were. We're still running on budget today. As far as water and sewer lines, if you've been down 249, everything has been cleared. We're starting hopefully this week actually putting piping in, putting water in the sewer lines to the facility. Uh, as far as the site goes, we and we'll show you more on that. <coughs> We've done fireproofing going in the cafeteria area, the mechanical rooms, the roof is on in those two in those areas. We have the roof is on in the gym. <coughs> The uh, roof is on in the uh, cafeteria, so we're getting the second floor has been forward. Steel is set for the second floor on that side. Tim, two two quick things. One, we, we got to <coughs> if you've driven by, you saw the beautiful flag that was on the side. People love. So we got a complaint that we took that it was because we had to do fireproofing yeah, on the side. So just want to say we got that complaint. Oh, y'all are not American. The second you get asked a lot of that. The, no, it did come up quite because it's beautiful when you well, ride by it. Um, the second piece, uh, Tim, the 24 days are directly related to. I mean, right now they're directly to having steel, different the delay on the steel. We have we still have some steel that's delay. We also have some brick that has not it, it's a delay on it. it. In the big scope, we're still moving. We're still moving the puzzle around. So what we're doing is we will get about December, January being back on full schedule. So it's, it's really supply chain driven and not work site related dri yeah, driven or I'm not gonna slow down on the site itself. I mean, it's, I mean, they're moving right along. I like we get dried in. That's the most important part. We get into winter. So the more <laughs> we can get dried in, the, the better off we'll be duck work skewing up. Uh, Electrical mechanical rooms are coming together. The switch gear was a delay at one time, and that should be here this week. It was a little bit of a bump in the road with that, so it should be here this week, and then we can actually get power into the building, which would be a nice thing there. Thanks, Ken. So the image that's up on the screen right now is from last week, earlier in the week. Uh, every month, Heartland does drone footage, which is fantastic, and love to get the visual of the property. Um, I can attest to what Mr. Pollock said. It's a very busy site. When I was out there last week, there were three trucks delivering steel. There were welders on the decking. So they are definitely moving when the uh, weather provides the opportunity for sure. So similar to last presentation, just want to give an update on some of the spaces. I won't transition them like last week, last time, but you can still see uh, the progress that's being made at the site. Or not. I think you just oh, roll. Cool. Sure. So, thanks, Mel. So, this is the back of the site. Uh, you can see what Mr. Pollock was talking about the steel being installed on the south side of the building. Uh, the second floor that you see right in front of you in the top left, that's where our fifth graders will be housed. So, the decking is, has been poured, the steel frames are there, and you can really begin to see uh, how tall our building will be. You can also see in the middle of the building, that's where our media center will be located on the first floor. And then on the second floor will be our STEAM lab and extended learning area. This is where the majority of the work is taking place at the moment. Next is uh, what most students and what fa most families see when they pass our building from 249. It's the back of the building, obviously. You can see the fireproofing that has taken place on the, the right side of the picture. And then on the left side, again, is another image of the second floor, fifth grade area our second and third grade that would be left housed on the first floor. Getting into the building now, this is our main street. Uh, again, on the right, that's what that uh, area will look like when we're all finished. And then on the left, that's where we're currently at. Uh, again, you can begin to see where the stairs will take students upstairs to the STEM lab and also that fifth grade wing. The next image is the first hallway uh, being put, put in, which is great. So on the left side, this is where our second and third graders will be housed. Uh, it was a great day on site because the construction workers' uh, fashion decisions matched our color palette. So <laughs> now the hallway is where um, there'll be an extended learning area for our second and third graders. Uh, you can also kind of see the width of the hallway and begin to envision students walking through there every day. Next to where my favorite classrooms are beginning to be defined. So this is an example of a third grade classroom. I love the natural light coming in. Um, 
per teacher. That is a, needs an amazing teaching opportunity. That's sometimes you don't get with a small window in your classroom. So on the left, again, that is a third grade classroom. And then on the right side, you can begin to see some of our furniture decisions that we're making. So in grades three, four, and five, there'll be more uh, options for seating. Uh, you know, as we all know, not all students like to sit in a chair all day. I was one of those students. So there'll be desks available in this class for students to sit, um, students to collaborate with a friend on the whiteboard table. Uh, you can also see some of the different storage in the uh, classrooms. This is very important to our teachers that they could store manipulatives, store some of the resources that could be used throughout the day. Our next image shows a kindergarten classroom. Love the size of these rooms. This is on the north side of the building. So our kindergarten will be facing South Quaker and uh, the old Tavern Farm. I, I think there's going to be some amazing opportunities there for learning. And you can also see that the furniture in these rooms will be a little bit different to meet the needs of those students. So you can see that students will be housed in pods. Um, there also be some mobile bookcases that they can move around the class where the kids can really engage in the literature and engage in discussions about that. So outside of the construction, I want to give you an update on our progress. Uh, as I mentioned in our last work session, we wanted to get the redistricting reminder out. Got a lot of great feedback. Uh, whenever I'm at Watkins, a lot of parents and students will stop me and say, hey, I'm coming to your building next year. Um, it was really cool earlier today. We didn't do student move in. Uh, I was at the front desk at Watkins when they were enrolling. They were coming from a neighboring school division. The first thing they said is, oh, we're going to that new school next year. So they already knew, I think it's because of the, the work that was done on our website. Aside from that, a lot of great feedback on our social media pages. Uh, we have a Twitter page that gives updates on the construction. Uh, we also have a Facebook page that has been very popular. So you can see some of the data we're getting back uh, from our posts. Uh, it's been a great resource for our community. I think it's fantastic that we can really document this historic moment. Uh, it's also been a great uh, piece of recruitment. I will say that since these went active, I've uh, got many emails, uh, also some LinkedIn messages. Uh, from teachers in neighboring counties. So we'll make sure we continue with these posts. Uh, also, as you uh, have seen in the previous slides, we've been spending a lot of time trying to get ahead of the supply chain issues. So talking about furniture, talking about AV, Mr. Helfer, we want to make sure that when the school does open next year, we're ready for our students and we're ready for teachers. So that's been a, a long process, but we're kind of getting towards the end of it at this moment. And then the very last piece with Ms. Al uh, Allison Anderson, we got together and we're starting to talk about um, staffing the schools, not just Quinn Elementary School, but the three elementary schools. So we have some exciting things coming up in November, even though it's a short month, one and two are going to be key. In terms of staffing, to me, it's about three great elementary schools. You know, yes, I'm the principal of Quinn, but we want to get all three right. So we're going to sit down this month, really look at our enrollment figures since they've settled and begin to determine how many teachers we're going to each building. So it's going to take some time. And also we want input from our teachers. So we will be sending out a survey this month to see what they're thinking. You know, would they like to remain at their current school or would they consider transferring or requesting a transfer to a different school in the school district? But again, it comes back to three grade schools and that's what kind of driving our, our process. Number two is hands down the most popular. I mentioned it last session, but this time we're moving forward. Next Monday at this time, our survey will be out. This will be a three-step process. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to ask input from our community. We want the community involved. We want them giving ideas for what our mascot should be. There will also be some school colors on that to pick from to see where everyone is thinking might be a good uh, school color for a point of elementary. After that first um, kind of initiative, we're going to get all that data, bring it back together, and start to have focus committee. We're going to have a staff focus committee look at this admissions. We're going to have a parent focus committee. And then the third one is my favorite. We're going to get some kids together. We're going to get some future Quinn Elementary students together to look at the names, and we're going to create a survey. One last one about the community. My goal for this is next time I'm here, October or November 22nd, I want to share the mascot and color for this. So the very all, all the colors are within the color palette that we're already utilizing in the school. So <laughs> it's not like somebody will pick something wild that doesn't match. Yes. It all fits in. There's 11 of them. Yeah. Then um, the next school board meeting. Maybe once the once the board takes action we'll get with the board and if we need to shift that date we'll yes and we'll have no we'll have no we want to know the news yeah. Yeah. <laughs> if you go out to the site and announce it out there <laughs> facebook live there you go and then our, our file this is ongoing is just any moment we have to look at instruction look at our vision that's key and that, and that could be looking for resources 
look at how we can use these spaces, how can we reimagine um, elementary instruction as well. Is this, this move, right? No. No, that's just So that's the parent drop off. Wait, that's the parent drop off on the left. Yes. And the bus drop off where the, 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 uh, the, the, the insulation is. Yeah. So we were discussing New Kent Elementary, some of the issues with traffic flow. We had that in mind as we put this plan together, as far as the, the long loops for buses yeah. and the long loops and the two different directions that, that cars would flow out or vehicles. The other thing we have been working on is the allowance portion of this crowd. Uh, everything from, um, like you said, the AP cards, that's automatic, and then a lot of that's going to put that together. I've been doing the access board, booking the call again, and that makes sure we get what he wants out of that. And uh, it's also in the, uh, the camera systems for the team. Do we have any update on the overhang? Did we get an estimate for the the element the canopy. the canopy for the bus loop? For New Kent, I mean, Quentin Elementary or New Kent Elementary? Uh, okay. New Kent, New Kent Elementary is, a, I mean, Quentin Elementary is already part of the project that was just a input thing. Mm -hmm. What we did, what I have done down in New Kent Elementary was we were the MNF that got a trailer guard that's already been put in place to put a each day of vacation for public right there. We have not got anything for the school to school in the school of that situation. I have but, and we're timing that with the redesign piece right. as well. Okay. So, because um, I don't know if that's going to be the front of it. Right. Everything that's is done yeah. and so we are with we that, are providing yeah, some I mean, cover I mean, for the parent drop off piece because that's the longest haul. Right. Uh, but we're also being conscious that if we're talking about a five year plan, we don't want to be tearing so out. But so we do that. have a short term solution and then looking at a long term. Okay. So. Thank you for the update. Thank you both. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Great progress. So we are going to move on to our uh, action items. <clears throat> Do I hear a motion to approve the superintendent's recommendations regarding personnel matters as presented? I move we um, approve the personnel um, uh, superintendent's recommendations on personnel um, as, as presented. And do I hear a second? Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Um, next action item. Do I hear a motion to approve the superintendent's recommendations regarding student matters as presented? Do I hear a second? Second. Any discussion? Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Uh, do I hear a motion to approve the sale of school nutrition services surplus item as presented? I move that we approve the sale of the SNS surplus item as presented. Do I hear a second? Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Um, last action item is our amended calendar to consider approval of calendar revision to designate November 22nd and 23rd as days off for 10 and 11 month staff. I move we approve the uh, calendar revision um, designating November 22nd and 23rd for day off for staff and students. And do I hear a second? Any further discussion? Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? And the motion carries. And our next meeting, I just want to clarify that before we adjourn. Monday, November the 8th. 
with that, our meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Huh? Yes. I don't